This video is a continuation of the boundary layer concepts and we're going to be applying the concepts that have been introduced in the previous video uh, regarding the boundary layer thickness and try to apply them onto uh, the, the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, but first we need to obviously look at the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, the Navier-Stokes equations are reduced to this form on the basis that you're assuming that the flow is steady and when we say that the flow is steady that means that from the Navier-Stokes equations the term partial u by partial t or the term partial v by partial t those are zero those go out then the flow is 2d and laminar as well that means that the z direction uh, equation that goes out of the window as well and then uh, the terms partial u by partial z and partial v by partial z and this equation and this equation respectively they go out as well other than that we are assuming that there are negligible gravitational effects so the term rho g uh, goes out as well okay and then on the left hand side we usually have uh, this entire thing multiplied by density so we move that on to the right hand side of the equation um, and then over here we have uh, viscosity and then when that's divided by rho it's converted into kinematic viscosity okay so this is the simplified version of Navier-Stokes equations for steady 2D laminar flow with negligible gravitational effects. Uh, other than that, you also need to uh, involve the effect of the conservation of mass equation, which is going to be partial u by partial x plus partial v by partial y because you're looking at uh, the flow in terms of 2D. Now you would think that maybe it's easy, or not easy, it's in a way shouldn't be that difficult to solve these equations because you already have a couple of boundary, uh, boundary conditions. The first is that the fluid velocity that is far away uh, from the body, from the plate let's say, is the upstream velocity u. Okay. And the second condition that you have is that the fluid is sticking to the solid body surface so the velocity uh, fluid velocity is zero at a distance of y is equal to zero uh, from the plate. At y is equal to zero, the velocity, the fluid velocity is zero as well. But uh, no one has, a, has been able to obtain an analytical solution to these equations for flow past any kind of body. Okay, so that means that this is a very difficult problem and uh, that is where the boundary layer concepts come in because Prantl was able to impose those approximations that are valid for larger Reynolds number flows and he was able to simplify these governing equations and then one of his students whose name is Blasius actually ignore this it's actually B-L-A-S-I-U-S his name is Blasius he was able to solve the simplified equations for the boundary layer flow uh, past a flat plate parallel to the flow. Okay. So I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, behind the mathematics of it, but I'm still going to uh, give you an overview of how he was able to uh, use this technique and present his results. So what we can see is, or what we have discussed until now, is that the boundary layer is thin. And what that means is that the component of velocity that is going to be normal to the plate, so if this is the plate, and the component of velocity that is going to be normal to the plate, which is v, that's going to be a lot smaller than the component of velocity that is parallel to the plate, which is u. And the other thing is that the rate of change of any parameter that we're looking at across the boundary layer is going to be a lot greater along the flow direction. So when we talk about rate of change, then that means partial by partial x is going to be uh, should be a lot smaller 
then partial by partial y because the the rate of change of any parameter across the boundary layer across the boundary layer should be greater than the flow direction the flow direction is x so that's going to be a lot smaller than uh, in the flow direction y so we've got these two conditions and once you use these assumptions you can plug them in into these equations and you can simplify these equation equations and, and, and arrive at these equations now okay so these equations over here the set of equations that are boundary layer equations uh, and then the original navier stokes equations as well they're both nonlinear partial differential equations they're both pdes and although they're both pdes there are differences in them and the major difference that we should uh, remember here is that for the boundary layer flow over the flat plate uh, the pressure term has been eliminated and then that means that the pressure is constant throughout the fluid um, so the pressure is basically playing no role in the flow that represents the balance between the viscous and the inertial forces uh, in this derivation and then like I said you've got two uh, boundary conditions and those are uh, hold on do I have it here no okay and those boundary conditions essentially are that you've got u which is going to be equal to zero and so is v when y is equal to zero okay this is no slip condition and the second one is that u is going to be approaching the upstream velocity as y is going to be approaching infinity and that is being indicated as some kind of distance far away from the plate okay so in in mathematical terms uh these equations over here um these are elliptic equations and then the equation that we have here they're uh, parabolic equations what you should know is that physically what this means is that whatever is going to happen downstream of the plate uh, at any given location in the boundary layer it cannot affect the flow upstream okay that means that if the plate let's say ended uh, when its length was L or whether you increased the length of the plate so that it is 2L now the flow within the first segment in L is going to remain the same doesn't matter if you increase the length or not okay the flow in this first segment is going to remain the same and now Glassius was able to reduce these PDEs uh, to the form of ODEs then uh, and he was able to solve these equations. Uh, what he did was that he argued that in the dimensional form the boundary layer velocity profile on a flat plate should be similar. It doesn't matter what the location along the plate is. So then th this is what we just talked about that physically whatever happens upstream uh, doesn't matter what is happening downstream that cannot affect what is happening upstream okay so then the boundary layer velocity profile on a flat plate is going to be similar regardless of any location that you pick along the plate so then in terms of uh, this ratio u by u this is some on the right hand side you've got this unknown function that uh, isn't determined yet so you need to find this out you need to find this ratio out other than this he was able to apply um, an analysis of forces that are acting on the fluid within the boundary layer and he showed that the boundary layer thickness uh, grows or becomes larger as the square root of x and is inversely proportional to the square root of capital U and you can rep he, he represented it like this so now 
that there is an equivalence that has been established, he was able to uh, basically go ahead and find some kind of variable that could be plugged in here to basically uh, make this term, the boundary layer thickness term, equal to this term. And he introduced something called a dimensionless uh, similarity variable, which is the second one. This is the dimensionless similarity variable that he introduced and plugged it in into this equation. Basically, this became equal to the similarity variable multiplied by this. And then he introduced this stream function as well, uh, where this function is an unknown function. Okay, and then he was able to uh, basically simplify these and convert these from PDEs into ODEs in terms of U and V. And I, I'm not going into the detail of it, but the point that I'm trying to make is that he was able to uh, basically give us a relationship between the boundary layer thickness in terms of this variable over here into uh, a term that could be converted into basically Reynolds number. So basically you've got eta over here which is being multiplied by uh, this entire term over here. I'm going to come back to this in a second. I'm just going to show you that once he got to uh, these two equations over here, he was able to substitute these equations into the governing equations that we previously saw, which were uh, the reduced equations, the boundary layer equations. And then he was able to, after a lengthy manipulation, he was able to get a nonlinear 3D ODE in the form of this equation. And then he solved this equation based on the two boundary conditions. Um, but there is no known analytical solution to this equation as well. It's, it's easy to do it, to integrate this equation on a computer, but you don't have an analytical solution for this equation. And uh, these equations, or this equation here, along with uh, the boundary conditions that he was able to identify, are termed as the Blasius solution. And now we're going to come back to uh, this term over here that he was able to, by doing this, he was able to find out this similarity variable that he had substituted here, the value for it, he was able to find out uh, for eta. And eta is basically equal to, approximately equal to 5 as you reach the end of the boundary layer. Okay, when you divided by a capital U is approximately equal to 0.99, then according to the Blasius solution, eta's value approaches 5. And then you can plug this in now. You can plug this in, eta equals 5, into this equation. And you're going to get, yeah, you're going to get this equation over here. Okay. So now based on this equation, you can go ahead and simplify it and write it in terms of uh, the relationship of the boundary layer thickness with Reynolds number. You can simplify it into this. So then uh, it's easier for us to now go ahead and find out the boundary layer thickness uh, because now we have, have an actual relationship to be able to do that. And just like that, he would. It can also be shown for the displacement and the momentum thicknesses as well. He was able to find out these two relationships as well. So the boundary layer is thin, provided that the Reynolds number is large. And then based on that, we get to uh, these three important uh, boundary layer thickness relationships. And now that we know what the velocity profile is, inside the boundary layer based on the Blasius solution, uh, 
we can go ahead and determine the wall shear stress as well. Um, and from Blasius solution, this is the wall shear stress now. Okay. And what this indicates is that the shear stress is basically decreasing with increasing x because of the increasing thickness of the boundary layer. Uh, and that means the velocity gradient at the wall is decreasing as x increases. And the other thing is that tau w here, the wall shear stress, varies according to u t 3 by 2 power of 3 by 2 not uh, by u as we saw for a fully developed laminar pipe flow over there tau w uh, varied as u varied over here uh, this is one of the differences so now that we have relationships for the boundary layer thicknesses and we also have a relationship for, for wall shear stress uh, we can directly relate this wall shear stress uh, to drag on uh, the object because drag is being caused by the shear forces on the body so we can basically go ahead and simplify this further uh, or try to simplify this further and try to find out the relationship for drag in simpler terms so that it can be evaluated for any uh, object but again it's a complicated procedure uh, you basically consider something called momentum integral boundary layer equation for a, for a flat plate I'm not going to go into the detail of it uh, but what I am going to show you uh, is how it's derived so I'm just going to show you uh, how this uniform flow past the flat plate is identified and then the fixed control volume that is selected and then by theory and experiment it's assumed that the pressure is constant throughout the flow field and the flow that is entering into the control volume at the leading edge of the plate is uniform and the velocity of the flow that is exiting the control volume at section 2 varies from the upstream velocity at the edge of the boundary layer to zero velocity on the plate. Okay, So by doing this and by uh, basically evaluating forces in x direction on the plate, uh, we go ahead and find out the momentum integral equation for the boundary layer flow and we are able to find out tau w, wall shear stress, in terms of the uh, momentum thickness, boundary layer momentum thickness. But the question is that why was there a need to uh, basically not just stick with this relationship and try and find out a different relationship? The reason is that this, for this relationship over here, we need to know the detailed exact velocity profile in the boundary layer and that is not always possible. For the simplest cases, maybe you can do that, sure. But when the objects start becoming more complex, the velocity profile starts becoming more complex, and then you don't really know the exact detailed velocity profile in the boundary layer. So then you can go ahead and basically use this equation, and you're able to uh, use this equation by applying crude assumptions on it. Uh, you can take a guess at the velocity profile, and it's still going to allow you to obtain reasonable results for uh, drag and shear stress and if you want to take a look at this further you can go and take a look at example 9.4 example 9.4 in Munson's book I'll leave the reference in uh, the co in the video caption for, for it and then based on this uh, wall shear stress equation you can go ahead and work out uh, the equation for drag as well but it's more convenient to use instead of drag this is just this equation being simplified further and then you can this, this is the equation that can be used to find out drag but uh, it's, it's harder to work with that so instead of using drag itself we use dimensionless uh, a dimensionless quantity which is called 
the local friction coefficient, Cf, and this is what we use to find out drag. It's the equivalent of drag, it's just dimensionless, so this, this is the local friction coefficient right now. And then this local friction coefficient, right, sorry, this is just the local friction coefficient right now. This local friction coefficient can be used and it can be approximated using the Blasius solution to give the values in terms of Reynolds number. And then for a flat plate of length L and uh, width B, the net friction drag, which is represented by DF, it can be expressed in terms of the friction drag coefficient, which is CDF. Okay, So this is what we usually work with. Um, instead of using drag, we talk about the dimensionless quantity, friction drag coefficient. Okay, So this is a, an extremely important equation. But even this can be harder to work with at times because you don't know uh, or sometimes it's hard to figure out what or how you can work out drag over here. So then what we do is that we reduce this friction drag coefficient after applying um, approximations onto it. We reduce it in terms of Reynolds number. Okay, So now that makes our life a lot easier that instead of having to work with drag and velocity profiles and stuff we can just go ahead and take a look at what the Reynolds number is and we can calculate the equivalent uh, friction drag okay and one way to do it is by looking at this diagram and then uh, this CDF the friction drag coefficient is going to be depending on obviously Reynolds number whether the flow is laminar or whether the flow is turbulent and then if the flow is turbulent then it also depends on also depends on the relative roughness the relative surface roughness parameter here okay so if you're looking at turbulent flow you need to look at the relative surface roughness parameter as well besides just the Reynolds number and um, the relationship between Reynolds number and friction drag coefficient. You could use this diagram, but uh, it's not that accurate, uh, you could say. So instead, you could also use these equations, and then it depends what kind of flow conditions you're looking at. And depending on that, you're going to have to basically find out the friction drag coefficient, because this is only valid for laminar flow, this equation. So if you were looking at it, depending on what the conditions are given to you, if you're looking at a turbulent flow, whether it's a completely turbulent flow or whether it's a turbulent flow for different kinds of smooth plates, then you have to apply uh, these equations, depending on whatever the flow conditions are that are given to you. Okay. So now that we have looked at the boundary layer thickness and the wall shear stress as well, we can basically see how they vary as the value of x increases as you reach the Reynolds number and then um, what the flow characteristics look like, how the wall shear stress decreases for laminar flow with increasing um, Reynolds number, with increasing length. So this is just visually representing that. I'm just going to move on and uh, go to an example for you, solve a question for you. Uh, so it's maybe going to th make things a bit clearer for the boundary layer transition. And the question is that you've got a fluid that is flowing past a flat plate. You've got the velocity given to you. And then you need to find out when the flow becomes turbulent or what the location will be when the boundary layer becomes turbulent and how thick is the boundary layer at this point. So you need to find out what the boundary layer thickness is going to be. Okay, And you also need to find out the location, so you need to find out x critical as well. So you already got, I'm just going to solve it for, let's say, water at uh, 15 degrees, and you can do the others as 
practice. So we already know that the relationship for standard bounded layer thickness is given by, in terms of the similarity variable, it's given by this equation, which is capital U over there. And then you can simplify it. And what you say is that the boundary layer is going to remain laminar as long as this condition is fulfilled. Because if you convert it into a Reynolds number, vertical divided by u. And because I've already said that, we're going to be assuming that uh, the boundary layer changes from a laminar boundary layer to a turbulent boundary layer at a Reynolds number of 5 into 10 to the power of 5. So I can plug that in here. Okay. And then I'm going to find, find this out in terms of, if I plug in the velocity as well, I'm going to find this out in terms of 1.7 into 10 to the power of 5 multiplied by the kinematic viscosity. And other than that, from this equation over here, I can find out the thickness of the boundary layer. And that is going to be equal to 5 into um, kinematic viscosity divided by the velocity that is given and multiplied by the value of x that I can plug in over here. It's going to have an under root on top. And I'm going to get some kind of value here in terms of, again, the kinematic viscosity. The kinematic viscosity, I can um, check that out from uh, table B2 at the end of Munson's book. So once I do that, I can plug in the value of um, kinematic viscosity, and I can find this out, the value in terms of meters, and I can find out the value of the boundary layer, the standard boundary layer thickness in terms of meters as well. Now what could be a question is, that is it possible for you to find out other than the standard boundary layer thickness? Is it possible for you to find out the boundary layer displacement thickness? Or is it possible for you to find out the boundary layer momentum thickness? So if you can, go ahead and do that. And besides that, also uh, use this example and work out the boundary layer thickness for these other uh, parameters that are given to you so you can get a bit of practice in.